off the coast of Egypt, northeast of Alexandria. Seven kilometers further out, there's said to be a giant secret slumbering under the surface of the water. This used to be the Nile Delta dotted by islands, but over the past 2,000 years, these islands have mysteriously disappeared. A legendary city was supposedly once located here, maybe even two. The ancient texts that remain speak of a place called Heraklion and also of a place called Tornis. Legend or historical fact? Frenchman Franck Gaudio first stumbled across this mystery some 30 years ago. He met an archaeologist who told him there could be sunken cities in Aboukir Bay. From that moment, Franck Gaudio was hooked. Initially, all we had were some documents mentioning two cities, Heraklion and Tornis, only in ancient writings from Herodotus, Diodorus of Sicily and Strabo, that was all. The thinking was that the Canopian Nile Delta was where the Bay of Aboukir is today. And when I went there myself, there was just water and nothing else to see. So if there is anything there, it must be under those waters. Even the world's top archaeologists had only a very vague idea of what lay slumbering beneath the Bay of Aboukir. There was a lot of guesswork. Um, there were comments in classical texts, um, Strabo and people like that writing, and Herodotus indeed, writing about the area, and, but giving clues, but uh, nothing at all specific. And no one was really absolutely sure where the site was. What did life in the Nile Delta look like over 2,000 years ago? There are hardly any contemporary accounts. One of the few that does exist is the Nile Mosaic of Palestrina. It depicts the bustle of everyday life, temples and ships. But it's not much use as evidence. Reality and imagination often overlap in such images. And there were no artifacts. Franck Gordio sets out on a carefully planned journey into the past. Where could this city be? There were very few sources. Herodotus talked about a temple in Heraklion. Diodorus talked about a port at the mouth of the Canopian arm of the Nile. Strabo described a city called Tornis, but also mentions Heraklion. There were very few texts, and the texts were confusing. They talked of two cities, of Heraklion and this mysterious town of Tornis. This place seems to have been in its heyday about 500 BC. But where was it? And what did it look like? It seems clear that it must have been a port. What does that tell us about trade? How much trading went on between the countries of the Mediterranean? Some ancient historians talk about this being the gate to Egypt for Greek ships. Here, out at sea, just a few kilometers from the present-day coast. But would those writings really be backed up by evidence on the sea floor? Better evidence than just an old mosaic? One big question is how important, how extensive was long-distance maritime trade? And what sort of interactions, in particular, were there between Egypt and the Greek world? One view that's common among historians is that trade in classical antiquity wasn't terribly significant. Um, this is partly a fact that ancient writers don't talk about it terribly much, and partly due to the fact that the research agenda of many classical archaeologists has been much more focused on the superb works of art and architecture. So was there really so little trade in ancient Egypt, or was it just not written about? The search for answers begins a long way from Egypt, here in Paris. Du, du 
Jet en or, le premier qu'on ait trouvé. Franck Godiot is widely regarded as the pioneer of modern underwater archaeology. And yet he never actually studied archaeology. He's a mathematician and statistician, qualifications that he will later put into practice in the search for the sunken city. One day I decided to take some time out. I wanted to do something worthwhile with my time. Because of my passion for archaeology and my love of the sea, I decided to learn everything there is to learn about underwater archaeology. By chance, Franck Gordio heard a story about the supposedly submerged city off the coast of Alexandria. Back in the 1940s, a pilot described seeing strange shapes as he flew over the sea. But nobody seems to be interested in his sightings. Franck Godio asked the Egyptians to grant him a permit for a research expedition. The Egyptians have faith in the Parisian, but they insist that all finds be handed over to the Egyptian state. The major challenge, of course, was that the bay is so big. We didn't know where to start looking, so we scoured the whole area, about 150 square kilometers. This hitherto unknown Frenchman plunges into his once-in-a-lifetime project. The academic world watches with interest. When you get into a discipline where you're not an expert, people look at you very skeptically. It's normal. You first have to prove you've got what it takes before people who've already achieved a lot in the field will take you seriously. Franck Godio won't be put off. He concentrates on his strengths as a mathematician and statistician. He spends days in front of his laptop. Initially, he sees the riddle of Heraklion Tornis as a calculable mathematical problem. My methodology was completely different. It was much more rational than had hitherto been the custom in maritime archaeology. I investigated electromagnetic dragging technology, which hadn't existed until then. To that end, I reached an agreement with the French Atomic Energy Commission to develop a nuclear magnetic resonance magnetometer. Using this probe, Godio has the bay scanned. It takes years. The research boat cuts back and forth according to a very precise plan. It's hardly what you'd call an adventure, but his strict procedure does deliver some results. Godio enters all the data into his computer. By combining depth soundings and magnetography, he puts together a complex visualization of the seabed. There are some unusual features. There must be something there. Not until he's reached this point does Godio start planning to take the plunge. He puts together an international team of scientists and divers. And initially, Jean-Claude and the other divers find nothing. The nearby city and its drainage, the mouth of the Nile and the river mud, all make the work very difficult. It was difficult to see anything because of the poor visibility underwater. We could see about a meter, maybe a little more. You realize it's going to be difficult. It's like you're blind. It's not nice work. Jean-Claude returns to the research ship dozens of times without having found a thing. Godio himself spends most of his time in front of his laptop. He's the mastermind. 
he directs his divers to places where the many years of seabed scanning have shown up anomalies. Finally, the divers make a discovery. The first thing we could see was an encrusted stone or a block. It was difficult to see what it was in the water. But the first thing we could make out seemed to be a series of walls. There seemed to be something there. Are these really the first traces of Heraklion or Tonis? We started on our first dig. In reality, it was really quite superficial, basically just sweeping the surface. And we discovered that the reef actually consisted of large limestone blocks, blocks of limestone that were smooth and arranged next to each other right in Aboukir Bay. And that was it. That was when the adventure began. Godio's methods seem to work. The location of the walls corresponds to the measurements already taken. There was a long magnetic line 150 meters in length to the south, and we tried to find out what was causing these magnetic signals. So we began to dig right in the center and discovered a wall of large limestone blocks. Digging 75 meters further west, the same wall. 75 meters further east, again, the same wall. So we have this large limestone wall 150 meters long to the south. And to the north, we found an identical wall, parallel to it. Gradually, the contours of a large structure emerge. Now it has to be identified. What kind of structure could this be, submerged right in the middle of Aboukir Bay? Finally, Fran Godio is convinced that he's discovered the legendary port. The city is clearly more than just a vague myth. The French autodidact decides to get some academic backup. And not just anybody. He approaches respected researchers at Oxford University's Institute for Archaeology. Professor Sir Barry Cunliffe is one of the world's leading archaeologists, and his colleague, Professor Andrew Wilson, specializes in maritime trading in antiquity. The Oxford experts are stunned by what this unknown Frenchman tells them. When um, Frank Godio came to talk to us about the project, um, most of us here hadn't heard very much about it because um, it, it hadn't become very public knowledge. Uh, we were absolutely staggered by what he had to show us. It was almost unbelievable. We, we had no idea that there was such quality evidence just there uh, beneath the sea. So um, uh, uh, that meeting uh, sticks with me for a very long time. So what are these large limestone walls? Could they be the magnificent Temple of Heracles mentioned in some legends? The international team of divers and archaeologists set off on further expeditions to Egypt. They're accompanied by technicians, restorers, and Egyptologists. They're going to scour the seabed, and they plan with military precision.
The divers divide the seabed into numbered squares so they know exactly where they are in the murky water. They really are looking for a needle in a haystack. When they think they've found something, the divers first have to suck away several meters of mud and sediment. It involves a lot of luck as well. Here, where they believe the temple should be, they discover a large monolith, perfectly preserved. Franck Goriot's team of experts know what it is. This monolith is a nars, a shrine, which must have once stood in the holiest part of the mythical temple. The Naos, a large monument made of red granite with an inscription. It was unbelievable because the Naos was a monolith which contained the altar room statue, the most important statue in the altar room. And the inscription on the monolith told us that it was the statue of Amun Gereb. So we knew that we were in the famous temple of Amun Gereb and thus in Heraklion. The Amun Gareb temple, named after an Egyptian god. The Greeks called the holy place the Heracles temple. The shrine proves that it must have stood here, as does what the divers discover next. These finds surpass their wildest expectations. Three colossal statues, broken into just a few pieces, but otherwise in a surprisingly good condition. When you see the outline of a hand or a head, you realize this is something special. It does get you excited. And when we brought the statues up to the boat, I thought, wow, that's really impressive. That moment, the moment we found these statues, it really was a magical moment. The statues are clearly a queen and a pharaoh. The third figure is the god of the waters of the Nile. Magnificent images from the Ptolemaic era that ended in 30 BC. The three statues are put upright and freed of the worst crustaceans. They're then salvaged and go on a journey to exhibitions around the world. Having made these finds, Franck Gordio is able to reconstruct the legendary temple. We have this structure that's 150 meters long, and we know that this is the temple with its naos, this monolithic shrine, which included the statue of Amun Gereb. So it's the temple of Amun Gereb. 
To the west, at the entrance to the temple, stood these fantastic colossi hewn of red granite. This is a very significant temple. We know that in these temples, the new pharaohs were bestowed with their titles and power. The temple was also very important to the Greeks as well. This was where, according to legend, the Trojans hid Paris and the royal spouse Helena, just before their love sparked the Trojan War. The divers find more artifacts in the temple, like this stone tub, in which an image of the Egyptian god Osiris was laid out. There's no doubt that Heraklion must have been an important religious site. But where does the name Taunus come from? And beyond religion, what was the city's significance? The site promises to provide answers that can't be found in the history books. Heraklion is, is so important because it is a key site in the sort of articulation of Mediterranean and, and Egypt. Uh, and it's all brilliantly preserved. It's, it's under the water, whereas if this had been a land site, it would probably have been built over and had centuries of destruction from other buildings on top of it. But here, beneath the water, it is beautifully preserved. This is one such object, the kind of thing historians wouldn't have considered worthy of attention. An anchor made of stone. Evidence, perhaps, of the shipping trade in antiquity. These stone anchors were only effective because of their weight. They weren't used by river barges, they would have sunk in the mud of the Nile. So it seems clear that large, seaworthy ships must have anchored here. The expedition team finds hundreds of these anchors. Gordio enters every single find on his data map. Slowly, the outlines of the city become visible. To the north of the structure, along this magnetic line, we found many anchors. And when we put together their locations, they form a line. The question is, what could that be? We carried out a dig in the middle and discovered the bottom of a canal with its layers one on top of the other, 30 meters wide. The same thing towards the west. So it seems we have a canal that extends for several hundred meters here. The divers work meter for meter along the former canal. And they make another discovery. And those first shipwrecks are not the last. The divers find dozens more, all concentrated in one area. To the northeast of the canal, we discovered hundreds of anchors. And between the anchors were the remains of ships, of very many shipwrecks. So we've definitely found a dock here. And again, the contours of the city become a little bit clearer. The surprise was the sheer number of shipwrecks. To find over 60 wrecked ships in the port um, is a phenomenal addition to our knowledge. There's enormous potential for really reshaping our understanding of ancient shipbuilding technology. It's particularly exciting that the kind of very 
characteristic shipbuilding tradition that Herodotus seems to talk about, putting ships together with short pieces of wood, almost like bricks, he says, with tenons that go through quite a number of boards. Almost every day, Jean-Claude's team of divers finds new wrecks. The large number of finds is unique in archaeology. What's particularly exciting is that some of these are not simply Nile barges, but maybe seagoing ships. That would argue for a rather more active involvement of Egyptian traders in maritime trade than we had assumed from the written record, which tends to um, emphasise the role of Greeks and Phoenicians and other non-Egyptians in maritime trade with Egypt. It looks as if, if the material from Heracleion includes seagoing ships, as it may well do, then we need to add Egyptians back into that picture too. So it seems that 2,500 years ago, the Egyptians were much more involved in maritime trade than had been thought. The finds lend credence to the Nile mosaic, which portrays busy shipping activity. To the southeast of the temple, we made a new discovery. Again, a lot of shipwrecks. It seems there was another dock with more than 65 ancient wrecks. This proves that there was lots of trade going on. As a result, our topographical understanding of the city is much more precise. That's great, because this city corresponds exactly with the descriptions in the ancient documents. We're at the gates of Egypt and at the entrance to the Greek Sea, as the Egyptians called the Mediterranean. And we have some very intense trading. At this point, Franck Gaudio and his divers change their strategy. Instead of focusing on large objects, they concentrate on ceramics, pots and vases, which may give clues as to where the ships came from and what their loads were, and how active trade was between Egypt and the other states around the Mediterranean. To shine even more light into the darkness, Fon Gaudio gets another expert on board, Catherine Gratelou. The Frenchwoman is a specialist in the identification of ancient pottery. It's an extraordinary sight. Despite the tectonic movements here, the finds are in amazingly good condition. Mute witnesses of a way of life sunk and lost in the sand and mud, but often completely intact. The pottery finds are among the many artifacts which were important for Heraklion's barter and trade with the whole of the Mediterranean region. Some examples of this trade are amphoras which come from the island of Samos and from Lesbos, or amphoras from Rhodes, all of them from the eastern Mediterranean. There are all these different types of amphoras, and this has enabled us to prove that trading went on. Another piece of this huge puzzle. The pottery, like the anchors and the ships, also confirm that Heraklion must have been a multicultural melting pot. The dimensions of the find also surprise Catherine Gratelou. Every time I see it, it gives me a lot of pleasure, intellectual satisfaction, to see all this material in front of me. Every time, it's a piece of history they bring up to the surface, and Heraklion is an exceptional place. More incredible finds, which give a much better idea of how Egyptians and Greeks lived here.
religious and everyday objects, the crown from a small statue of a pharaoh. Life here must have been rich and colorful. Several pages of the history books are going to have to be rewritten. These finds give an impression of daily life, of the life of priests, but also of soldiers, of the inhabitants of this city, and of the traders. What kind of vessels and pots did they cook in? Some were imported for very rich people, others were made locally. We have Egyptian objects with Greek inscriptions. We have Greek objects with hieroglyphs. This all gives us an amazing picture of how Greek and Egyptian cultures mixed here. This small oil lamp, for example, perfectly preserved, with soot still sticking to the spout. It was made by Egyptians, but its shape is inspired by lamps customary in Athens. It is absolutely uh, an archaeologist's dream, a site that uh, is untouched, where everything is uh, pretty well preserved and is all available. All you have to do is to bring in the skills, the techniques, the manpower, and uh, there is no end to what you can learn. How rich was Heraklion? Just seven kilometers from the coast, they bring up fantastic gold artifacts from the sand. Jewelry adorned with animal motifs like this lion's head earring. Clearly very fashionable in ancient Egypt when it was under the sway of Greece. Even so, these gold artifacts do provide important clues, and that includes the city's topography. It's probable that most of the gold was an offering, thrown into the sea in honor of the gods. In some places, there are large amounts, evidence that there might have been a holy site there. And again, Godio is able to redraw the map of the ancient city with more precision. More altar rooms were found, like this temple over here in the northeast. It's a small temple made of limestone bricks. It's a very old one, dedicated to the god of sciences, a very beautiful and well-preserved temple. The fact that all these temples exist is very important, because it seems that Heraklion kept its religious significance, even when Alexander the Great moved most trade from Heraklion to Alexandria, the new capital. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great established the new port of Alexandria. The city quickly gained in importance, while Heraklion's significance as a trading port dwindled. That is well known and well documented. But the many gold artifacts around the temple date from the period after the founding of Alexandria which means that the old port remained an important religious site. Its name, Heraklion, is proven by the find in the temple. But what about the mysterious city of Taunus, which is also mentioned in the ancient texts? From the very beginning, Franck Godio has wanted to answer this question. The divers find a strange black granite block in the murky water. At this point, Jean-Claude doesn't know that this find will go down in history.
At first glance, it's easy to see that the stone is incredibly well preserved, even though it must have been in the sea for some 2,500 years. A short time later, the hieroglyphs are unscrambled. It's a tax decree by Pharaoh Nectabanos I. Foreign trading ships will have to pay 10% tax on all their goods. But the real sensation is a note about the location of the stele. The discovery of this stele solves a 2,000-year-old mystery. Inscribed on this stele are the words, the pharaoh orders that this stele be erected in the town of Tonis. And since we know that we're in Heraklion, this stele provided us with ultimate proof that Heraklion and Tonis are one and the same city. So we found out the name of the city, the old name, and the name from the Ptolemaic era. Of course, that was fantastic. So the legendary port is really just one town, but with two names. Tornis was the Egyptian name, and the Greeks called it Heraklion. A simple explanation carved in stone that solves a mystery thousands of years old. Now the team knows exactly which town it's diving in. And using the many finds, Franck Gaudio is able to create a lively and uniquely detailed picture of the old city. Heraklion Tornis has resurfaced. We have this large central temple, this smaller temple, the docks and the wrecks, the canal. But cities also have residential neighborhoods, so where are they? There are only indications of them, thanks to missing artifacts in certain zones. Why? Because these houses were built of mud and papyrus. These materials have disappeared. What's left? Just a few rough pots, everyday objects. And you can see that these residential areas stretched around the temple a long way. So we now have a very good impression of this large port called Heraklion. We understand how the city worked. We understand how the boats accessed the docks from the Nile via the canals. And we know about these various canals, which connected the docks with the Nile and the sea. We can reconstruct life in this city. So this was Heraklion Tornis, a place that had been all but wiped from human memory. From Gordio brought this legend back to life. A city mentioned in very few texts, and now we know how the citizens of this city traded and whom they traded with, and what their ships actually looked like, how the temple was built, the kind of monuments that they erected to their kings, and the sacrifices they made to their gods, what kind of jewelry people wore, in what mirrors they looked into, what kind of vessels they had, and what kind of ladles they used. But why did Heraklion sink beneath the sea? Was it a slow process or a sudden natural catastrophe? We discovered that there are several reasons why the city sank into the sea. On the one hand, the ground in this region of the eastern Mediterranean was slowly sinking, about 10 centimeters a century. Heraklion was built on sandy ground containing lots of water. And at some point, everything built on this soil, the main temple and everything else, suddenly subsided several meters. 
An earthquake or tsunami in the 7th century must have been the final blow for this city. None of the finds date from any later. Franck Gordio and his team have been studying the lost city for more than 15 years. Are there still secrets to uncover? Take the city of Pompeii, which was found in the 18th century. The study of Pompeii is far from over. Pompeii was a resort, very interesting, but it didn't have any particular religious or economic significance. But in Heraklion, we're at the door of Egypt. We're in the city to which kings came to be sanctified by the chief god Amun Gereb. This place is twice or even three times the size of Pompeii, and it's submerged. To explore all that, I would need two or three centuries. I think what we know about Heraklion today is just a fraction of what we'll find out over the coming decades and even centuries. We're still at the very beginning of our search.